I'm Anne Louise from Minerva, and we're here today to sew along with you this delightful poofy sleeved pencil dress. This pattern includes an option for extra ruching on your skirt pieces and a collar. However, today we're going to sew through option A. This option features some lovely darts to add shape to the waist and those dramatic sleeves that are literally my favourite thing, up there with like coffee and bunny rabbits. The sleeves are pleated at the sleeve head and then gathered into the wide cuff at the bottom. The front bodice also features some box pleats. You can pretty much make this dress in any fabric. The pattern suggests brocade, cotton blends, crepe, crepe back satin, damask, double knit, jacquard, lightweight wool blends, ponte, sateen, stretch velvet, stretch wovens and velvet. I think the list covers almost any fabric that you could want to sew with to suit anyone's personal style. Of course, everything we talk about today is available on Minerva right now and will be linked down below and will pop up throughout this video for your ease of shopping. So let's get started. First things first, fabric choice. We chose this absolutely gorgeous deluxe soft stretch velvet knit fabric in a dark teal petrol colour. It's a medium weight 88% polyester and 12% spandex blend and can be machine washed up to 40 degrees. The other ingredients we need to make our scrumptious velvet dress cake is a 22 inch concealed zipper, matching thread, hook and eye closures, some lightweight fusible interfacing and a lining fabric of our choice. For the sleeve stays, I'm a bit of a fan of the contrast lining, so we went for this lightweight bright pink lining. A 1.5cm seam allowance is used throughout unless otherwise stated and back stitching or tying off seams to finish them is recommended. While I'm cutting out my pieces, I like to first mark the darts with pins, then after taking the pattern piece off, I trace over the pins with a similar colour chalk, or whatever you like to mark your fabric with. Marking both wrong sides of the fabric makes for even and neat darts on each side of the piece. After marking and separating all our skirt and bodice pieces, it's time to stay stitch to make sure nothing gets pulled or pushed out of shape as we make up the garment. To make up the stay stitch, choose a straight stitch and go round back and front neck edge, front lower edge where the waist seam would be, and while we're stay stitching, we're going to reinforce the front skirt at the centre front ensuring we stop at the small marked dot and pivot to the machine to get that crisp point edge. Then clip once straight down the centre front to the stitch line. Now everything is stay stitched politely into place, we can go ahead and bring our darts together, pinching them into their little triangles, which, if we're getting super technical, is called the dart take-up. Making sure all the marks are even on both sides and meet together and then pinning in place. So this is all our darts marked out. Back bodice darts, front and back skirt darts and front bodice pleats all ready to be sewn up. To sew darts, start at the bottom edge sewing upwards, slowly tapering off at the top pin and running the stitches off the edge. Then all darts are pressed towards the centre of their piece. Darts are essential for any shaped garment. These tiny folds of fabric make a garment more form-fitting. The most common dart is the plain dart, used most around the bust, hips and how we are using them here, at the waist. They can also be used to make pleats, princess seams and style lines. To form the front pleats, start the same way as the darts. However, instead of tapering off the edge of the fabric, we're going straight up to the top marked pin and finishing there. Interesting bit of dressmaking history, pleats date back to ancient Egypt, 
where they were used to decorate the tunics of their rulers. Whether you're making this for an Egyptian ruler or not, the pleats are then pressed flat with an even amount each side of the stitched line. And here you can almost pinpoint the exact moment I realised I hadn't stay stitched the front neckline. We then attach the front and back bodice pieces right sides together at the side and shoulder seams. Finish seams in your favourite method. Mine is just to fold the seam allowance under itself so the raw edges meet the stitch line underneath and straight stitch it down. It keeps the raw edges out of the way and helps prevent fraying. If you have a particularly wiggly fabric, looking at you crepe de chine, you can zigzag stitch it down to make sure you're catching the fabric underneath. Normally with velvet, you get covered in thousands of tiny fibres when sewing. I call it velvet shrapnel. A seam finish can help protect you from such things as velvet shrapnel. But this velvet is pretty shrapnel free, meaning I don't look like a fairy blue muppet, which is always a plus. This is our progress so far. Isn't she pretty? This velvet is just so tactile. We're then repeating this step on our skirt pieces, pinning then stitching right sides together on the side seams. Now all our seams are finished and pressed flat, we're going to bring our two halves together with right sides together. We're going to match up side seams and darts. The most tricky part of this pattern is lining up the point on the bodice with a corresponding dip in the skirt. I thought it would be best to baste this bit in as the amount of pins I would need is unnecessary and dangerous. My phone doesn't recognise my fingerprint anymore, I've poked myself so many times with a pin. Basting is handy to test if a garment fits, for example on a garment with darts or they can make it easier to sew bulky items like zips or hemming jeans and they're also excellent for how we are using them to hold two slippery fabrics together.
We then machine stitch everything in place slowly and carefully, making sure not to catch any wrinkles. When we reach the marked centre, we're pivoting our machine so everything is nice and sharp looking. I didn't do a turned under seam on, in the waist seam. I just did a zigzag stitch around just to prevent a little fraying. And it makes me feel a little more secure that the skirt piece isn't going to fall off while I'm wearing it. Which is an irrational fear, but a fear nonetheless. After clipping and pressing our waist seam downwards, we're popping in our invisible zip with, surprise surprise, our invisible zipper foot. I like to baste my zip in first to ensure my waist seam matches on each side and it means I don't have to battle with 20 million evil pins. After sewing both sides of the zip, we're closing the zip and with right sides together, we're getting as close as we can to the zip stitching and taking it from the top, we're pinning and then stitching down the centre back seam. We then give everything a good press, pressing the back seam open with a light heat so we don't melt the zip and pressing the zip into neatness. While we're at the ironing board, we're attaching the interfacing to the wrong side of our facing pieces. When ironing velvet, it's a good idea to iron it right side facing a fluffy towel, a specific velvet board, or like I do, some leftover velvet fabric, just to help protect our little fluffy velvet fibres, making sure they all stay in that right direction. Steam is also your friend for a lovely spa treatment and when working with velvet. But now we're just slowly attaching our interfacing and double checking there's no residual glue on our iron before we iron something else because I have definitely never ironed glue onto the outside of a skirt after ironing on the interfacing. If you do accidentally crush fibres while ironing, do not despair. Apply enough steam to fill a sauna and gently brush the fibres back into their right direction using a toothbrush. Matching the side notches of our side facing pieces, we're sewing right sides together, pressing the seam open. And then folding up the non-notched bottom edge by about a quarter of an inch and hemming. With right sides together, we're attaching our facing pieces to our neck edge, matching shoulder seams and notches. Attaching interfacing like this is a great way to stabilise and support the neckline. Interfacing is also great for collars, cuffs and pockets. Mm -hmm. 
Highlight to match seams by putting a pin dead centre of each seam and lining the pins up and pinning each side. The pins are easier to see than that little stitch line and they're easier to feel for as well. What's your best seam lining up technique? We then sew our facing and bodice pieces together at the neckline. That stay stitching we did earlier coming into play, preventing our neckline from becoming distorted. Then understitch the seam allowance to the inside of our facing pieces to prevent any rolling forward. To finish the facing, pin back edges right sides together and sew down on the inside of the zip tape. Trim corners and roll facing to the inside and tuck to the shoulder seams. I just want to take a quick break here at the halfway mark to talk about our wonderful community here at Minerva. We really want to encourage everyone to take up something crafty. At the top right of the post, you will be able to follow Minerva and keep up to date with offers, new releases, general fabric prettiness, and of course, tutorials, sew-alongs, and top pattern picks. Let us know what you would like to see next. Comment below, we love to hear what you think. To form sleeve pleats, bring folds to broken lines that were marked on the number 7 pattern piece, following the arrow direction on that piece. Machine or hand sew into place. I'm not 100% sure my pleats are facing the right direction, but they look pretty good, so we're going to go with it. Even if you do make a mistake, as long as you're happy with the end result, does it really matter how you get there? Now sew li two lines of gathering stitches along the bottom edge of the sleeve. We're then going to stitch the side seams of the sleeve, sleeve band and sleeve stay pressing them all open and flat as we go. We're then taking our sleeve band, folding in half to bring raw edges together and making sure the seams align. Then putting our sleeve and our sleeve band right sides together 
and pulling the gathering stitches to fit in the sleeve band. I found this a little fiddly, as the velvet fibres kept pulling the pieces away from each other, and the wrong side of the fabric is quite smooth and slidey. The fabric was very determined to do its own thing, but with patience and lots of basting, it all came together. By working through tricky areas like this, it's how we gain experience. We learn how different fabrics react and how best to manoeuvre them into the position. I'm a big advocate for taking a break on a project if it's getting too frustrating. The project's not going to go anywhere. Having a break can just clear your mind and means you can come back with a fresh point of view. After basting those two pieces together, we're now creating a sleeve band sandwich between the sleeve stay and our pleated and gathered sleeve, with right sides together and the lower edge sewn in place. A lot of the fiddliness I encountered was down to our choice of fabric. However, I was surprised how easy the pattern came together, considering the high-end look of the finished garment. I do think that it is the plus side of a slim fitting dress. They just look so smart when they're finished. After turning right sides out, baste the top of the sleeve to the top edge of the sleeve stay, lining up the raw edges to create that baggy sleeve. Holding the main body of the dress inside out, place the sleeve inside, right sides together, matching the underarm seam and front and back notches. I'm just thinking about how multi-seasonal this dress could be. With so many fabric options and with this warm velvet, it's more of a winter dress with thick boots and tights. But in a floral cotton blend or a bold block print crepe, it could be a very effective for either your office work or a fun night out with the girls. I'd love to see this dress as a longer sleeved version, or maybe, maybe with a pleated skirt instead of a slim fit. Please tag me if anyone tries any alterations with this pattern. After stitching the first row of stitching at the normal seam allowance, go around again in the seam allowance at about 1 8th of an inch from the first stitching. Then trim the seam allowance as close as you can to that second row of stitching. If 
you're working in a fabric with a tendency to fray, it might be a good idea to bias bind your armholes. There's now only two things left to do, hem and attach the hook and eye. I love hand sewing hems, but when I say love, does anyone love hemming? It's something I find relaxing at the end of a project, sat watching TV with my hemming. Nothing could be more chilling, and I really like the end result. I do this by slip stitching into the hem allowance, then picking up two or three threads of the fabric on the main garment, which can take a while, but when you get into the swing of it, you nip round in no time. What's your most relaxing sewing project? Let us know in the comments. And there we have it, the dreamy poofy sleeved pencil dress I've always wanted. The sleeves fit off the shoulder slightly and the little point at the front adds a fun detail. As I've said, I was surprised about how easily everything came together and I'm really pleased with the result. I especially love the velvet and the liquid glimmer of all the different pleats and gathers on the sleeves makes for a really nice effect. It's silky and all I need now is a winter party to attend. Here at Minerva, we'd love to hear your views. What would you like to make with this rich stretch velvet? And what fabric would you use for this new look pattern? Any questions, comment below and we'd be happy to answer them. And don't forget, Minerva Craft Club members get a 10% discount for 12 months when they sign up. And creating a free account, you'll get a welcome present of a discount coupon. So join us with our lovely community of makers, follow, comment and like. And we'll see you next time.